Right, good morning. Um, just starting the Zoom session here. Can anyone hear me at the moment? Excellent. We've got a yes there. So thank you for joining me on this walk. I'm Rob Kilner and I've been doing market tours uh, for a couple of years, well probably about three years and then the pandemic hit. Um, so when the Civic Trust were looking for ideas for their talks and walks I thought I'll give this a go. Um, so this is the first time I've done a virtual walk like this so I'm using some tech which I'd not even heard of a couple of weeks ago. So fingers crossed it will pan out well. And I thought uh, we'd start on Brigitte at the junction of Kergate. Um, the reason Brigitte is a good place to start a market talk is because this is the original marketplace stretching down to the bridge there where cloth markets were held over the river and then gradually over centuries the markets stretched up Brigitte right to the top there where there was a market hall and I'm going to try and share an image of the, uh, not the market hall, the market cross that was at the top of Brigitte there. So this is the uh, Cosins map from 1726, 1725, 1726. And you can see Brigitte there, nice big wide market street, uh, where just about where the B in Brigitte is. And Kergate comes in and further at Brigitte, you can just see the Moot Hall and then the Market Cross at the top. Um, so Leeds Markets have provided inspiration over centuries to shoppers and traders and also travellers and writers and artists. Um, one of the earliest written accounts is by Celia Fines and she wrote about market day in Leeds. She was traveling through England and wrote uh, her account called Through England on a Side Saddle and when she came to Leeds she, uh, she said there is still this custom on market day at the sign of the bush just by the bridge. Anybody will go up and call for a tankard of ale and a pint of wine, a pint of wine, and pay for these only. It shall be set to table to eat with two to three dishes of good meat and a dish of sweet meats. So it was like a, a proto sort of Leeds tapas. You paid for your beer and your wine and you got some uh, 
she got some meat to go with it. Um, I think she, she thought she was a bit overcharged. She, she paid a groat, I think, for her beer. Um, I think there was a premium for people who, who work from round here. Um, but now we're walking down Kergate and on our way to the market and just stop outside Shoe Zone. So this is where Ralph Thorsby, the famous, famous in Leeds anyway, famous historian lives before it was Shoe Zone. Um, and he also gave us some information about the market. Um, Celia Fines was 1698. Ralph Thorsby was a bit later, about 1715, just before that Cousins Market. Cousins map was um, drawn. And Thorsby, uh, Thorsby gives us some insight into what kind of things were being sold in Leeds Market around the beginning of the 18th century. So he, he wrote that after the cloth market finished, which was very early in the morning, the market people of other professions as country linen drapers, shoemakers, handwear men, and the sellers of wood vessels, wicker baskets, wanded chairs. If anyone knows what wanded chairs are, let me know. Um, flakes, fences, etc. Fruit sellers, wholesale and retail, farmers selling dairy cattle, fish traders, butchers in the shambles behind the moot hall, the egg, butter and poultry sellers, and the corn traders. So that was 300 years ago. So we'll see as we go into the market, what's changed from then, what's still being sold, and what is, uh, is still changing. So I'm going to try and share another image from uh, my phone of this it's a beautiful image of Kergate. Now this was late 1890s before the current building was built. But on the left, you can just see the, um, the original covered market, which was put up in 1857. Let's go back to the uh, camera. So we can see that the streets are pretty much the same same layout at least. Um, but Vicar Lane and New Market Street were widened after that photo. Okay, so I'm going to get across the road now. Just see the Corn Exchange, another marketplace in Leeds. And then we're going to head into this magnificent building, Kergate Market. There's a lot of roadworks going on at the moment, widening of pavements, etc. And I know there was some big lumps of stone found recently when these roadworks were going on. And there was some speculation that it might be from uh, one of the previous buildings that was here. Um, there was a, a chantry here in the 15th century. Um, this land was given in the 15th century to the church by William of Potter Newton. And for, for a few centuries, it was where the vicarage was. Okay, so as you come into the market, you uh, you hit, whoops, you hit with the senses. Um, 
smells, the heat, even. It's a, it's a microclimate in here. And um, the sounds. I'm not sure how much of the, the sounds you'll be picking up here. But um, Chris Watson, who is a, a famed sound recordist, when he's, when he's teaching at Leeds College of Art, um, he encourages his students to come in here and record these sounds. The sounds of traders yelling, which uh, is a disappearing sound. Um, Chris Watson's worked with David Attenborough. He records for, for uh, David Attenborough's programs. And um, yeah, he encourages people to, to take notice of the sounds. So this is where the market tours usually start by the Marks and Spencer's centenary clock. Um, it's five past 12 on that side, 10 past 12 on that side. So anyway, we're doing about right time-wise so far. Um, so this clock was put here in 1984 to celebrate a hundred years of Marks and Spencers. And as um, many of you will probably be aware, Michael Marks uh, came over, set up his barrow in the outside market of Leeds. He came over from Belarus um, and settled in Leeds and uh, signed up Tom Spencer to work with him. And they set up what has become a multi-million pound FTSE 100 company from a wheelbarrow in the outdoor market. Um, so that was 1884. Uh, we've got some other fairly old stalls here. We've got Dorothy Goodall, famous for leg wear. And uh, that's Dorothy's daughter there, Chrissy, holding up a sign. Um, hi, Chrissy. What's the bargains today? You got a rush on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Excellent. Walking socks, fantastic. Fishnets, brilliant. Lovely. So, your stall is 1963. Was that that was your mum who started that? Excellent. Uh, so that is 50 odd years. Is that? Yeah, it's a lot, isn't it? We'll work the maths out. <laughs> Right, I'm just going to pan back here a little bit. This is the nut shop. Hi, Nigel. Can I put my camera on you? Not so bad. Not so bad. How are you doing? Good. Fantastic. How, how long has the nut shop been around? 1956. Right. What's that? 21 plus. 44. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, and you've got an old, you've got the old cash till there. Lovely. Good to see you. I'm going to go for a walk around. Um, so here we've got the old shop units under the balcony. And Chris's is number 12. This one here is number 14. So that gap there should be number 13. But um, it isn't because it's an entry entrance and it, there's no superstitiousness to not having a number 13. It's just that when this place was built, there wasn't an entrance there. Um, there was a huge clock. There was a huge clock 
where Marks and Spencer's clock is now. Um, if you know the clock at Oakwood, that was in that position. But the traders thought it was a bit too unwieldy. Um, and they petitioned to get it removed and to have an entrance put in, a central entrance. So that's why there's no number 13. Right, so I um, showed you the image earlier of the original covered market building, which was built in 1857. And then uh, around 1875, there were further improvements. And these buildings here, which you can just see above these hoardings, were built. Uh, and these are known as the block shops. Uh, Two-storey buildings. And when they were built, they, these were open streets. Um, and there were butchers, etc. in here. It soon became evident to them that putting a roof on was good for trade, kept the rain off. Uh, and that's why they're now roofed. Okay, so we're on uh, quarter past 12. I'm looking to do about half an hour. Can't remember if I've mentioned that. But um, I'm just going to have a little walk down the old butcher's row. More block shops on the right here. And on the left, these are newer constructions. Um, and until fairly recently, there were, uh, I think about 18 butchers in here. Um, the last one standing was B&J Callard. Now there's, three or four butchers in the market. This, this side here was going to be demolished to make way for a, a six story hotel. Um, but that, that's fallen through. Um, so who knows what's going to happen here. But that, the, the thing about the market and looking at its history and the culture of it is it's always changing. Um, it's changing a lot at the moment. You see the pandemic had a big effect on trade. Um, the market was able to keep open through the pandemic for the essential traders. Um, but many traders had to Shut up, shut up shop. Okay, we're in um, the newer halls of the market here. These were, these were built after the huge 1975 fire, um, which took out about two thirds of the market. Luckily, no one perished in the fire. Um, but it it changed the uh, the construction, the architecture of the market significantly. Okay, well, what what started the fire in 1975? Someone's asked. I've heard various stories. I don't think anyone's ever um, put the finger on it. I've heard it was a can of hairspray that got lit or a fallen lamp, a, a gas lamp. Um, some other people might have other ideas. Feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, so in the outdoor market, you get a sense of what the, uh, 
the Brigitte market might have been like, you get a bit more yelling out here. Um, you get some right bargains as well. Look at them blueberries. Um, and that's what makes it a market because you've got traders competing for your, for your cash. Um, whereas supermarkets, you know, they're convenient, etc. Um, but they're not really markets at all. And they're not that super. But this is a real supermarket. Okay. That's a super quick walk around the outdoor market. I'm, uh, I've got to do some shopping as well today. I'm, I'm going to make a uh, pasta this evening. There's a new pasta stall. One of, the, one of the new stalls or the newest stall in the market is a, a chap, Francesca, at the top, who's opened a fresh pasta stall. He makes the pasta every morning. So as we go back into the market, I might pick up a few things. Okay, we're going to head into the market kitchen area, which pre-pandemic was um, was really growing in popularity. Some fantastic traders in there making beautiful food. Before we do go in there, um, a few years ago. I did a project with Compass Live Art uh, around doing tours in the market. And I, I came in and started getting to know some of the traders. And uh, Eamon, who runs the Kurgate Cafe, was telling me about his customers and how the market's not just a, an architectural gem. It's not just a fantastic place to shop and eat but it's also a social service in that you know some people were coming here every day for a cup of tea just to be out just to feel human people who might be uh, socially isolated this was the place they would come and that really uh, had a huge effect on the way I viewed the market and markets in general and uh, that's one of the reasons why they're such important and fantastic places. So, got some music on here today. And there's also a Young Traders event. So, there's various fairs and food festivals and events that can happen in this market, in this area. And um, at the moment, um, um, sorry, I just saw someone I know there, that's Tony from Chapel FM up in East Leeds. Um, so yeah, this area can be used for art fairs, food festivals, etc. Just adds even more vibrancy to the place. Here's a famous Malcolm Michaels. <laughs> Good kiss there from Malcolm. And they sell fantastic bits of meat here. And um, if you're squeamish or have sensitive ears, cover them now. All right. Um, where have they gone? No, the sign's gone. There's a very rude sign there um, for bits of pork. I, I was talking to a, an eminent food writer about vernacular food. And uh, he pointed out that 
the thing in Leeds Market that you don't see anywhere else is one of the um, offerings in Malcolm Michael's offal store. But more of that if you come on one of my tours. But uh, this is one of the very old businesses in the market, Hayes Seafoods, 1880, see above there. Cliff and Michelle have been running this place for 35 years. And it started out um, over the road from the Corn Exchange and has moved around into the market and around the market. Um, but they sell beautiful oysters, Irish oysters and Lindisfarne oysters, and also these beautiful crabs, um, which are Yorkshire crabs. They're from Bridlington and they're beautiful. You can either buy them full, like that, or ready dressed. And uh, Cliff is the last crab dresser in the market, the only guy, the only person that does um, dress the crabs freshly in the market. So I'm gonna buy one of those crabs and uh, stick it with a bit of pasta um, for supper this evening. Cliff is just shucking some oysters there. I came in here last week. I'll come back actually, let's carry on. Um, this is the, the first pub um, in the, the market, the Owl, run by uh, Liz, who has home on Kergate, home restaurant, and they've got a, a Michelin uh, plaque there, and a top 50 gastro pubs sign. Had a lovely omelette in there for breakfast um, a while back. I can see, as Ralph Sorsby was saying, a lot of the things he mentioned, eggs and butter, still being sold in the market. Um, we've got Whitaker's farmhouse eggs and cheese here. Um, and as you can see up there in the uh, the old butter market, egg and butter market. And as we go up here, you can see a very old fish business there. Our Bethel, there's Joe. And I'm just going to get out of the way, out of the way of these vegetables which are being packed behind me. Okay. We walk up this row. Um, you can see here the barber's shop. This is where Brian cuts my hair. Occasionally, unfortunately, we can't go down there because the um, the signal won't stretch that far. But this barber's has been here for well since the market opened um, and there's been just three owners of that business in that's over a hundred years uh, and some of the fittings are the same so if you get a chance to go in there go and have a chat with Brian he's a lovely fella and does a good haircut too right we're nearly at half an hour. Um, just going to take you up on the balcony. There's Francesco with his pasta. Freshly made. Going to get a bit of tagliatelle after this is finished. You can see in, in some of these old units the, the glazed tiles. Um, the original glazed tiles. Some of these were butcher's shops and uh, that was easy to, to wipe down. 
This is Joss's gallery. Um, he's opened up and uh, puts on our exhibitions. So we're just going to head up onto the balcony so you can see one of the finest views in Leeds. Got the key somewhere. There we go. Okay, this is this isn't public access, so you need special permission to come up here, which I've got for the tours, which is great because it is magnificent. From here, you get a wonderful view across the top of the stalls. And we'll go out onto the balcony here. Um, I first came up here with a, an artist called Jake Attry, who um, when I was at college, he took us around Leeds, places to to sit and sketch. And um, this was one of the places. And ever since then, I've uh, loved loved it up here. From here, you get you can get the smells. You've got the flowers, the fruit. The bread, I don't know if you can see those oven bottom cakes on Firth and Payne over there. They are delicious. They're baked just up the road on Dolly Lane. They're great for a sausage sandwich. I'm going to finish with um, a little paragraph from City Lights by Keith Waterhouse. Um, the journalist, author, screenwriter who came from Leeds and wrote this book about growing up in Leeds and the, the market was one of his favourite places. He said, I was to roam the market times without number in my childhood and youth and have never subsequently visited Leeds without making the pilgrimage to these domed and turreted halls of plenty with their glazed brick walls, ornate balconies, embellished with cast iron dragons and Corinthian columns adorned with the city's coat of arms. What appears to be a dead sheep. Which you can just see the dead sheep up there. Um, although it is in reality a fleece between a pair of owls supporting a glittering glass roof. Yet whenever I think of Kergate Market, I see in my mind's eye what was indelibly stamped, stamped on it by that first confused and dreamlike impression, a shimmering crazy mirror montage of burnished scales, brass weights, marble slabs, naphtha lamps, mountains of pomegranates, horses' breath, billy cans, Iron clad wheels, squashed blood oranges, and big men with pencil stubs behind their ears shouting the price of carrots. My father's cart piled high with replenished produce. I rode home on top of a sack of Brussels sprouts, still nibbling my wedge of bread and dripping, and feeling as we passed out into the awakening streets that I had been in a grotto, the personal guest of a wizard. And uh, you know, I can empathise with Keith and his feeling of it being a magical place. It really is. It's a place full of uh, full of life and vibrancy, and it's the people that make it. And long may it last. 
So thank you for your time. I'm hoping to get um, the face-to-face -face in person tours back up and running again so you can come and join us on the balcony and um, yeah have a good day and come and do your shopping thanks very much <laughs>